Well, thank you all for being here this uh, afternoon. Uh, this will be probably a little briefer than what I normally teach on, on Sunday afternoons, but uh, just a little biblical uh, encouragement for fathers and husbands. Uh, you know, um, I think it's it's needed. Just some reminders. This is not going to be an in-depth uh, teaching on that, but I think it's, it is uh, needed. And also a reminder to those of us who of our fathers, uh, you know, reminds us of, of the example that they gave us. Uh, some, some of this I really uh, remember from the example of my father. And uh, so... Uh, wanted to bring that out this afternoon. But let's begin with a word of prayer before we start the teaching today. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for uh, the day in your house. We thank you, Father, for the blessing of the authoritative and living and breathing Word of God. Uh, That's our message, and Lord, we have nothing to say besides that, really. So, Father, we pray this afternoon that this teaching will be an encouragement to the husbands and the fathers uh, in this room, and that it will be an encouragement really to all of us, uh, Lord, today. And may we receive it as your word and your instruction and not a man's. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so, you know, I, I was got to thinking about this week about, you know, um, talking about fathers and biblical principles for fathers. And, and, and this is mostly what this is going to be this afternoon. Uh, like I said, not an in-depth teaching, but just some some reminders of the basics. And and you know, to be good at something, we need to be reminded of the basics over and over and over again. And Paul's good about that. If you know the epistles, uh, you know what we talked about this morning in Ephesians. Well, he doesn't just teach it in Ephesians; he teaches it in Romans. First and Second Corinthians, <laughs> Philippians, Colossians, <laughs> you know, all of those books, he repeats these things over and over again, maybe phrases them a little different in each of these. But, but there are, I believe, biblical principles for fathers that we need to be reminded of as fathers. Uh, I need these reminders, even though my children are grown, uh, that I still, I still have a wife at home and I'm a husband and I need to be reminded constantly. Uh, those of us that have been married for a long time know it's still an ongoing process. Can I get an amen? Uh, <laughs> that uh, we're constantly and hopefully improving, growing spiritually as husbands and fathers. Uh, I hope I'm a better husband than I was the day I got married. Uh, we grow in that. But some of these principles as far as for husbands and for fathers... I've written down up here on the board. You may not be able to see all of it. I will, I will call it out to you as we go along. But the first principle, I think, is a love for God and His kingdom first. Uh, our primary love is to be for God first. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, Matthew 6 and 33, and all these things will be added to you. And so we need to emulate this with our children, uh, so a lot of you got children at home and things like that. We need to, if, if we're going to tell them that this is what you know the God expects of us, then the husbands and fathers need to teach this or exe- exhibit this in their own lives. Uh, that that God comes first, His righteousness comes first. We are to seek His kingdom first. And. Uh, Another passage that you could use in conjunction with this is Matthew 22, verses 36 through 38. It says, And one of them, a scholar of the law, asked him a question, asking him, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. So are we as husbands and fathers, do our wives and our children uh, see this in our lives? Are we primarily, do, do they see the love of God uh, exhibited in our lives? Um, and you, none of us do this perfectly. We understand this. This is not perfection uh, that, you know, one day we will. One day we will love God perfectly, uh, but not in this life. But this is the goal to strive for, is loving God with all our heart and all our soul and all our mind. Uh, and 
this is what our, we should be exhibiting to our, to our families and in, in our lives. Uh, and I think this is seen in the things that we pursue. Uh, I was, yesterday, I was mindful of when we went out for Ajana's birthday party. We went out there. And it was a Saturday, you know, and it was already hot out there. And you got all these people out there, and I drove by ballparks, and they're out there all playing ball and softball and all these kind of things. And I thought about, I wonder how many people are as diligent about seeking God and His kingdom. Uh, and so our families see, it's not just about what we say. What do they see in our lives? Do they see us personally seeking God and His kingdom first? Do they see us, you know, in the scriptures uh, and, the, and, and those kind of things and in prayer uh, for them? And so this is, I think, the, the most really important principle is, 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 is that we love God and his kingdom first and that our family sees that, you know. Not perfection, as I said, but is that what they see as the general rule of our lives? Secondly, uh, and, and my wife did not, coach me on this one, but love and put your wife above all the other human relationships. And I was discussing some of that earlier with some others. And that's, that's hard sometimes to put, uh, you know, your spouse above all other human relationships. But let's be honest, us as men, we're focused upon, and I'll get to the providing part here in a minute, but we're focused upon our careers and providing for our families and all those kind of things. And that is uh, important. That's one of the principles that I have up here. But the human relationship that we should put above everything else, even our children, is our wife. They are a gift from God to us. Where would we be? We'd be a whole lot rougher around the edges. <laughs> We'd be, we'd be a lot more barbarian, let's be, be perfectly honest about that, without our wives. And, and God knew this. I'm going to make a helpmate. And so we're to love and put our wife above all other human relationships. Of course, Ephesians 5, 25 through 29 speaks of this. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for, for, no, one ever, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. Our love for our wives is to sanctify them. To sanctify them for God's kingdom. I mean, we are, we, we unapologetically believe in patriarchalism, that we are to lead our homes. And that means that our wives are our responsibility spiritually. It's not the pastor's <laughs> responsibility. Guys, it's our responsibility. And are we loving them in a way that is sanctifying them? as Christ sanctifies the church? Are we loving them in a way that is sacrificial? Like Christ loved the church. He sacrificed his own, not only his life, but you think about where Christ came from. Left heaven so that he might come down and purchase the church. Sacrificially died upon the cross for her. Do we love our wives in such a way? And so this calls us I believe in this scripture that we are to love and put our wife above all the other human relationships. But, you know, we still continue to respect our parents and honor our parents, but our wife comes first. We're to love and provide for our children. They're precious gifts from God. But we put our wife first because this is what I believe the scriptures teach us to do. Proverbs 5.18 says, Let your fountain be blessed and be glad, which means rejoice and be blessed in the wife of your youth. Uh, that doesn't, that means, you know, what it says. We are to rejoice in our wives, you know, to continue to rejoice from the time of their youth all the way till the end. You know, if God gives you, you know, 
until we're in our 80s or 90s or whatever like that, you're still supposed to be rejoicing in that wife uh, because God gave her to you. And we're to love her and to and to to honor her in that. And so I believe that we put uh, our wives' love and put our wives above all other human relationships. Thirdly, we are to provide for our families spiritually and physically. Uh, providing for our families is ingrained, I think, in kind of into our male DNA, at least most men, uh, to provide for their families in a physical sense of the word. We're going to get to that. But as Christian husbands and fathers, uh, we are have a calling upon us to provide spiritually, to sustain them spiritually. Uh, a, a, we're to be the guardians, I think, spiritually over our families. We're to guard them. We're to protect our families spiritually, uh, to be that protector, uh, to, to exercise that headship, uh, you know, over, and discernment. Yes, discernment. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the discernment thing. Uh, you know, I think about the Garden of Eden. Uh, Adam was not providing that spiritual protection that he should have. Uh, I remember doing a study one time in Genesis where basically I think that that probably while this conversation is going on between Eve and the serpent, Adam's just standing there. <laughs> so I'm like, you know, he didn't provide the discernment. He didn't provide the protection. And then we had the consequences of that. And he was held accountable. She had the buck stops at the husbands. If there's spiritual problems in the family... It's the, that responsibility falls not on her, but it falls on the husband in that, uh, and over our, our over our children, and so you know, and, and raise them. Our children were to raise them in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Uh, train and then in Proverbs twenty two six, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he's old, he will not depart from it. Now that doesn't mean that there's not going to be some bumps along the road. And that's not a 100% guarantee that if you train your children up that they're all going to be saved and all follow the path of obedience. But it is a general principle that, that you know, I think that there's better opportunity, let me say, that they will be obedient to the Lord, that they'll be saved, that they'll follow the Lord, uh, that they'll grow up in the church and, and love the Word of God. Faithfulness, yes, faithfulness. Ephesians 6 and 4, fathers... Uh, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. That's a serious thing. Uh, the discipline and the instruction. You know, the dis- discipline sometimes means <laughs> like that. And I'm not clapping. Uh, <laughs> uh, but both go along to provide that discipline. so that, And through the discipline, they understand the love of God. God's our discipline of them is a uh, symbol <laughs> of God's discipline of us. It teaches them uh, respect and love. But, but we do both. We instruct them. Uh, I thought of the, the Shema over there in Deuteronomy 6 and 4 in the verses following where uh, they were told, Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God, Yahweh is one. You shall love Yahweh your God with all your heart. And with all your soul, with all your might, these words which I command, which I command you today, shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons, and shall speak of them when you sit in your house, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as phylacteries between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. We are to constantly in our spiritual provision of our families to have the Word of God in front of them. You know, uh, one of the things I like in our house is having things, decorative things in the house that have Scripture. You know, if you come in the front door of my house, uh, I don't. there's a little sign up there, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's the first thing you see when you come through the front door. Now you say, well, you know, is that what that is teaching I don't know necessarily, but if you're going to have something in your house hanging up decorating it, ought to be scripture, I think. <laughs> and if you look around this room, all of those back there, 
Scripture hanging back there. You know, I think Scripture, when you come in that, in that hallway there, Scripture in there. We need to have the Scriptures constantly in front of our families, speaking of Scripture constantly to our families. And so that's one, one of the ways that we provide as husbands and fathers. But we do also, we are called to provide for them physically. You know? And uh, I think that's a part of being a real man, if you want to know my. If you want to measure one of the measures of, of being truly a man, a real man, it's not being all beefed up on testosterone or something like that. But it is of providing for your family spiritually and physically. Uh, Paul said this in 1 Timothy 5 and 8, but if anyone does not provide for his own and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and it's worse than a, an unbeliever is what it says uh, here, but an infidel is a better word. He's an infidel. Uh, our testimony, part of our testimony, men, is are we providing for our families? You know, I don't mean do they live in the biggest house and have the newest cars? And uh, that kind of a thing. But are they even provide the basic necessities? You know, a roof over their heads, food on the table. Uh, we're to work hard. We're to be a hard-working, diligent as part of our testimony uh, before our family. So we provide for them spiritually and we provide for them physically. Number four, I put this, pray and intercede for your wife and children daily. Part of, I believe, of our manly responsibility as far as husbands and fathers is to pray and intercede for our spouses and for the children that God's given us. And, of course, then when you get to be a grandparent, you intercede for them, don't you, Susie? (laughs) Brother Wayne, (laughs) you do. You intercede for them. You see that they are precious souls that God has given. Yes, sir? Just to add to that a little bit, I know... Not that I recall my children ever telling me they've heard me pray for them, but not, not to do it overtly, but maybe at times. But you remember the hearing. Not. And you remember the testimony at the conference uh, from Joel Beaky mm. about his dad. Yes. And, and he, he, yes. he heard his dad intercede in prayer. Yes. For. Yes. Yeah, I'll, I'll recount that story that he talked about. Yeah. Uh, if you don't mind me, no, no, oh, no. and Joel Beakey that we heard at the G3 conference talked about that they part of their, he just grew up with family worship. And he said, I heard my father intercede for me and my siblings thousands of times. Thousands of times he heard his father pray for their salvation. And then it's, I remember he said something to the effect that when the last one of his children was saved, then he said, okay, father, now... My grandchildren. <laughs> and so he started praying for the grandchildren. So it's, and that doesn't stop after they're saved, no. For their growth and maturity, you know, and those things. So we do that. Uh, the, one of the scriptures I used in relationship to this about interceding, it was a story, if you remember, of the first chapter of Job. He said, you know, it talked about his sons. He had seven sons, three daughters. And it says in verses 4 and 5 of that first chapter, it says his sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day. And they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. Now it happened when the days of feasting had completed their cycle that Job would send and set them apart as holy. And he would rise up early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, perhaps my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. It was a continual thing for him to intercede for his children uh, on a consistent basis. And we need to be consistent with that. I also thought of 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. And you get to put out of there for your family, (laughs) for your children, for your grandchildren. You pray continually. You intercede for them continually because, again, the responsibility for their where they are spiritually lies with us as husbands and fathers. Number five, take them regularly to the house of God for worship. Okay? You take them regularly to the house of God for worship. Psalm 122 and 1, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. The the responsibility for our families and our children getting to God's house and getting there regularly 
It's not, let me say this, it's not on the mamas getting the kids dressed and everything like that. I mean, you know, if we think that the, the primary responsibility is for them, the daddies, we need to make sure that things are in motion for them to get to God's house. Uh, yeah, that's what you did Sunday morning. Discipline was raised me. It's like I would feel weird if I didn't go. To, and I remember um, my senior year, we went to Disney World, the senior trip. You don't sleep for 24 hours. And then you come home. And we, <laughs> we didn't care about it before the morning. You're getting up. You're up and you did. You got to you. you get up and you go. You right. Church. Right. Right. And I hear sometimes about people saying, well, you know, it's just chaotic on Sunday morning sometimes. And da, 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 da. Well, it's usually things are chaotic because we haven't planned well. I, think, I, I don't think it needs to be haphazard. I think we need to prepare on, as you know, Brother Andre talking about the Sabbath today, but I think on Sunday evenings, we need to be preparing for Sunday morning. Saturday. Saturday. So, did I say Saturday? Yes, Seth. Saturday, Saturday evening. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> sure, yeah, 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 yeah. Y'all knew what I meant. <laughs> uh, Mary would have corrected me when I got home anyway. But anyway, but that's true. On Saturday evenings, we should be preparing for Sunday. You know, get your clothes ready. Get their clothes ready. Um, you know, it, to be ready for Sunday morning. Say, okay, when it gets time, let's say, and, and get up early enough that that, you know, Sunday you get them to the house of God. Uh, to Hebrews 10, 23 through 25, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. You know, we give an example to our children, men, of Sunday is God's day, uh, and we're going to go worship. We're going to go worship God. We're going to go read the scriptures, and we're going to pray, and we're going to sing. And, uh, and they need to see that. And I, I meant that with every fiber of my being this morning about the, the integrated worship thing. Whether they understand everything that's going on or not, they need to hear and see that. They hear and understand more than you think. Absolutely. And their 10 billion brain cells are a whole lot more fertile than my, <laughs> my brain cells that I have left. Uh, they soak up like little sponges. This is why you, it's easier for them at a younger age to learn foreign languages and all that kind of thing. But anyway, we need to have them in the house of God regularly, man. And then sixthly, model Christ before them in word and deed. Our speech and our deeds as husbands and fathers should model Christ. Um, in Colossians 4 and 6, it says, let your words always be with grace. That's an ongoing process, I will say that. Uh, unfortunately, in my lifetime, there's been some times that I've spoken without grace. Uh, and so, but we model that, we strive to speak with grace, especially, I mean, you know, with our, we, just because we have a bigger, louder voice doesn't mean that we should use it abusively. <laughs> uh, and I have a bigger and louder voice than most people. <laughs> I, I freely admit that, uh, you know. Uh, but when we speak, it should be with grace. It should be with building first your wife up, and then instructing and building your children up also uh, in these things. Uh, if we don't, then, then they will know it. Your children will remember, I'll guarantee you, your hypocrisy uh, very quickly if you don't live what you test, what you profess in your lives. Uh, John said in 1 John 2, 4 through 6, the one who says, I've come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. The truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly in him the love of God has been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. So, men, we need to model Christ to our wives and to our children and thereby have a good testimony. And when we get up to the time that we're gone one day, 
they can look back and say, my father, my husband lived that. And uh, so I thought that these were good reminders, good instruction for all of us. I needed to be reminded of this myself. Uh, in this sermon this morning, the other day. Putting on and putting off. That's right. The husband needs to put off and put on. That's right. And this is a, this is an exhortation for us to put on. That's right. To put on. To put on Christ. To put on the new man. And in doing this, we will be better husbands and better fathers, too. All right. Any other comments or questions or anything? I remember growing up and, uh, when I was little, my mom was very instrumental in uh, reuniting that flame that went out with my dad, so to speak, you know, Christ, I mean, spiritually speaking, to get him to go back to church. Because he grew up in a church and everything, but he just somehow between his teenage years and then the time he got married to my mom, the Lord used that to hit him. And ever since then, that's all he wanted to do was go to church Sunday morning. Yeah. And, well, you know, well, well, yeah. I mean, God create, God created us men to be the leaders of the home. Yeah, it has to be intentional. And it's got to be intentional. It's, it it's can't be passive and accidental. Like, passive man is not. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 He was very, yeah. He was a man full of integrity because of that. Yeah. Yeah. We should be as well. We should be as well. <laughs> uh, it's okay. Uh, I was just thinking of this great, excellent uh, principles. Six of those. I think uh, I think of things a lot of times. I was a teacher in the past, so I think of analogies and comparisons because my brain works that way. Picture that. Think of a candle. You think of a candle sitting on the table. Candle's made of wax, right? And as fathers you know, this all equates to you just sum it up: selflessness. Throw away the self. This is all you're, you're burning that candle for your children to light the way, right? So yeah. You're, you're really pointing to Christ. Yeah, right? that's right. If that candle melts and dies at the end, it's going to go out. It's gone. But hopefully, what you're going is your children <laughs> that flame and then we'll look at it. Right? That's right. I just think that's right. As a, as a candle. If, if I can burn as a candle all the way down in my kids, my family, my wife, and everybody, if they see Christ, it's, it's worth it. This yeah, thing. that's right. That's right. Uh, and I'll interject. My father used to use the term. You heard him. Uh, he said, I, "Not," but he said, "I would rather burn out than rust out." And so that's what our intention is uh, should be to burn out. Uh, you know, and 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 that's my prayer as a husband and a pastor and father and a grandfather. And that should be all of our. You know, uh, you know what is the that there's only uh, oh. Goodness, I can't think of the first, the, but it's only one, one, only one life that we get, and that will soon be passed, and we need to use that and use ourselves as a living sacrifice, as Romans twelve one and two talks about, uh, for Christ. So, all right, let's pray. I pray, Father, that you would help every husband and father in this church to be what he needs to be for Christ, for the witness and the testimony of our wives, our children, those around us. Help us, Father, in the Scriptures to remind us frequently of what we are to be and to put on Christ in our responsibility as husbands and fathers. Lord, I thank you for a godly father that you gave me that pointed me toward Christ. And I thank you for that. And I thank you, Lord, for these men in the church, this church that you where you put them, Lord, and for these young men that are striving to be godly husbands and fathers. I pray that we might give them encouragement and instruction and, and a good example also. Thank you, Father, for your word today. Thank you, Father, for those that were in the service today outside of Christ, Lord, I pray they heard the gospel and they will come to Christ. Pray for the work of the Spirit in their lives. In your holy name we pray. Amen.